Ticks. If that freckle moves, then it's not a freckle. The Virginia area is inundated with ticks. Both people and animals are susceptible to the zoonotic diseases that they transmit, and this seems to be rampant. There are three main tick species in the Virginia area. These include the dog tick, deer tick, and lone star tick. The four main diseases transmitted by these ticks include Lyme disease, ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, and rocky mounted spotted fever. Lyme disease is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, a spirochete. This is mainly spread through the Exodius scapularis tick, while Ehrlichiosis and Anaplasmosis is caused by Ehrlichia bacteria and Anaplasma bacteria, respectively. These two diseases are most commonly spread by Dermacenter variabilis, R. sanguineus, and Exodius scapularis. Finally, Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever is caused by Rickettsia rickettsii bacteria, transmitted by Dermacenter variabilis. In this research project, we looked at the geographical prevalence of these vectors and the clinical prevalence of the diseases that they caused. Lyme disease is most typically found in New England states, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. It is found completely on the East Coast and is absent in most southern states. Ehrlichiosis is most commonly found on the East Coast, with the highest prevalence being in North Carolina, Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee areas. It is only found in the West Coast on California. Anaplasmosis is found in Central and Eastern United States. The highest incidence of anaplasmosis is found in the New England area and North Central areas, while being absent in the West Coast and West Central United States. In 2013, 32 patients came into the Liberty University Clinic with tick bites. Only four had symptoms of Lyme disease. Blood was taken from each of the patients and sent to the lab. All tests came back negative, but each patient had the very unique rash that is associated with Lyme disease, so they were all put on antibiotics just to be safe. A few weeks later, all showed improvement, and all started to get better. This indicated that the four test results were all false negative. So finding the clinical symptoms of the bullseye rash, uh, it becomes a clinical diagnosis and you don't need to do any actual testing for it. That's good enough. Uh, but if you don't have that and you want to try to uh, figure out if it is, you can do a blood test to check specifically for antibodies against the Borrelia, uh, and that will prove, prove that if it's positive. If it's negative, it doesn't tell you a whole lot because about 30% of cases of Lyme disease will have a negative test. Um, and so it then comes down to that test plus your clinical suspicion whether you should treat the person or not. The local vet, Dr. Sarah Roshan, was interviewed to see her experience on the tick-borne diseases that she sees in her veterinary practice at Lake Forest Animal Hospital. She was asked to explain the tests that they do for the tick-borne diseases in the dogs and some of the results that she sees from them. Her response to this was that they, t they test every dog that comes into the clinic. This is part of a yearly routine checkup. She does not see too many cases where the symptoms are present before the positive test results are detected. The symptoms when seen are usually quite similar because be even between the different infections. She's only seen one case where the dog had symptoms due to her theolichia infection and they usually see symptoms from Lyme disease. Dr. Roshan was also asked to give her input on why she thinks that there is such a high number of Lyme positive and Ehrlichia positive canines. She believes that this is due to the fact that there is a larger amount of the type of ticks that transmit those diseases in our area. And she believes that that amount is growing and that she will see larger amounts of positives in the near future, despite all the prevention that they try to give out to dogs. 
As you can see from the chart, more than 1,000 cases were documented for their results on the 40X test. 1,274 of these were negative, while more than 200 tested positive for at least one infection. The most common infection out of these in this area is ehrlichiosis, followed closely by Lyme disease. The most common co-infection seen was ehrlichiosis and Lyme disease together. As you can see, the majority of ticks collected from the Lake Forest Animal Hospital were Lone Star ticks, with one deer tick and one dog tick also being recorded. Also, ticks were collected from a horse. All of these ticks collected from the horse were Lone Star ticks as well. In your group's handout on the last page, you can see the 40X test and the different possibilities of results that could show up on each. It also tells you what each dot on the test will mean. Up here you can see actual tests that were administered to canines and you can see the different variations of test results that come up on the tests. In the top left you can see an empty test that is, has no blood in it and is how it looks before the test is given. In the top right, you can see the control dot shows up, but this is shown to be a negative test for both heartworm and tick-borne diseases. To the bottom left, you can see a test that tested positive. This is a positive for Ehrlichia. In the bottom right-hand corner, you see two tests both positive for Lyme's disease. One you can see is stronger than the other and this is noted in each dog's record. This is noted to try to determine whether it is a first time exposure to the disease or if it is a past disease. If it is a first time exposure, the dog will be treated with antibiotics. If the dog has had this before, then it is not unless there are new symptoms that are showing. The reason why there may be a positive on the test, even though the dog has not recently been exposed to the bacteria, is due to the fact that these tests test for the antibodies of these bacteria, and those antibodies may stay in the dog's system for a while. When a patient presents with symptoms, the first step is to get a blood draw. This can be accomplished by going through three different veins. These three veins include the jugular, cephalic, and saphenous veins. Once the proper amount of blood has been drawn, it is placed into a tube and set aside for the test to start. After the blood has been set aside, the 40X test is pulled out and allowed to warm from its freezer location. The 40X test is removed from its packaging and the blue conjugate liquid is placed into a separate tube. Four drops of this conjugate liquid must be placed into the tube, after which three drops of the whole red blood are placed in as well. The blood and the conjugate are allowed to mix within the tube. During, after this has occurred, the contents of the tube are poured into the receiving portion of the 40X test. The blood and the conjugate run up the 40X test. When this reaches the action center, the test is snapped and then placed into the snap reader. After approximately eight minutes, the test is then read by the machine and the results are printed out for the vet to share with the clients. Here are four female Lone Star ticks in adult form underneath a dissecting scope. This is a cluster of 17 female Lone Star ticks under a different light. This is a close-up of a male Lone Star tick. Here is a close-up of five male Lone Star ticks underneath a dissecting scope. This is an engorged tick that was pulled off of a host. Here is an even closer look at male Lone Star ticks. Here is a picture of two engorged ticks. The bigger tick is a female Lone Star 
and the smaller tick is a deer tick. Adding to the ticks that we found in a clinical setting, we decided to collect ticks from the wild. We collected from a total of two different sites, one on a Bedford property and other here at the Liberty Mountain. The results from both sites are quite different, even though we took samples from the same time, same weather conditions, and on the same day. You can observe that on the Bedford property, there is a total of 82 ticks found, and on the Liberty Mountain site, we only found a total of four. The majority of the ticks caught were male, then female, nymph, and one unknown. We speculate that the divergence in numbers of ticks caught correlates with the altitude in which they were caught in. The Bedford property being at a lower altitude and the Liberty Mountain being at a higher. Also speculating that ticks may prefer lower altitudes than higher altitudes. The first step in tick collecting was going out into high grass locations in two different areas, one of a higher altitude and one of a lower altitude. This decision was based on both previously having ticks present. The method we chose to collect ticks with was the CO2 method. To do this, we took a coffee can and put dry ice inside of it. This was then placed on a white towel and put into high grass. From different trials, we found that the best length of time to leave the can was about an hour and a half. If it was longer than that, we noticed that some ticks were able to get away. When approaching the towel, you could see that the ticks had burrowed into the towel as if it was fur and they were trapped in the towel. We proceeded to take all of the ticks out from both the can and the towel and we placed them in collection vials filled with alcohol. As many of you know, the common symptoms of Lyme disease in humans is the bullseye rash, then flu-like symptoms, sore, achy, fevers, and then arthritic pain. There is much debate about whether this arthritic pain can turn into a chronic Lyme's disease which presents more as chronic arthritic pain. As the infection progresses more to the chronic side, neurological symptoms can present themselves also. Many of these symptoms are similar to the ones presented in dogs. First they get a slight fever, they can seem anorexic or very tired. Then they usually get lame, they have soreness in their hips and joints, like our arthritic pain. And then this can either lead to renal failure or some neurological symptoms also. These last two are both in the more severe chronic stages of the infection. The tick bike on dogs do not present themselves like they do in humans. There is not a bullseye rash that appears. The bite it, site itself does usually get swollen and raised from the tick bite. Ehrlichia or ehrlichiosis in canines presents with the following factors. Fever, anorexia, and lethargy. Bleeding disorders polyarthritis or lameness, lymphadenomegaly, neurological signs, with laboratory abnormalities of thrombocytopenia, hyperglobulinemia, proteinuria, and thrombocytopenia. However, in people, these are the clinical signs presented with. Fever, headache, chills, malaise, muscle pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, confusion, conjunctival injection, and rash in 60% of children and less than 30% of adults. Anaplasmosis is often misdiagnosed or diagnosed as something. Anaplasmosis is very difficult to diagnose. It is often misdiagnosed due to its symptoms of headaches, fevers, chills, myalgia, and malaise. These symptoms are very typical of other infectious and non-infectious diseases. Sometimes rashes are reported in accordance to anaplasmosis. Anaplasmosis is found in Virginia, and it is most common during the spring and southern months. The main vector for anaplasmosis is nymphal deer ticks. 
and the most common animal reservoir for this is the white-footed mouse. There are various different ways to diagnose anaplasmosis. The only way to actually confirm a diagnosis of anaplasmosis is by doing a PCR sequence or immunostaining methods. Common test lab results for anaplasmosis include low white blood cell count, low platelet count, and elevated levels of specific liver enzymes. In dogs, there are two forms of anaplasmosis. The first type is called anaplasmosis phagocytophilium. This is where the bacteria affects white blood cells transmitted by deer ticks. The other form of anaplasmosis is caused by anaplasma platys. This is where the disease infects blood platelets, which can lead to other bleeding disorders. This is transmitted by the brown dog tick. The common symptoms of anaplasma phagocytophilium are often vague and nonspecific. The common signs are loss of appetite, lethargy, lameness, reluctance to move, neck pain, or neurological signs. Anaplasma platys is by far the harder disease to detect in pets. The common signs for this disease is bruising of the gums and belly and spontaneous nosebleeds. Both forms of this canine anaplasmosis is found all throughout the United States and Canada, and they're caused by the deer tick, western black-legged tick, and brown dog ticks. Co-infections, while much less common than single infections, are still prevalent in this area. Take Grimm, for instance. Grimm was found in the Amherst Mountains. Even though Grimm was taken to Michigan more than two years ago, in these last few months he has tested positive for Lyme, Anaplasma, and Ehrlichia. As you can see from this video taken just a few weeks ago, he's still very happy and healthy. At this stage of the co-infection, Grimm is what you would call subclinical. That is to say, he is showing no signs of the disease. Since this video was taken, Grimm has been placed on antibiotics to treat the infections. When discussing medical treatment for tick-borne diseases, the primary method of treatment is doxycycline. 100 milligrams is usually prescribed and the patient is told to take it twice a day. There is a debate whether the patient should take it for 14 days or for 21 days. Dr. Hopright stated that he usually advises patients to take it for 21 days because he believes there is a chance of reoccurrence if you only take it for 14 days. Alternative treatments for Lyme disease include amoxicillin. Patients with certain neurological or cardiac forms require intravenous treatments with drugs such as penicillin. 10 to 20 percent of patients have persistent or reoccurrent symptoms, particularly those who were diagnosed later. Anaplas and ehrlichiosis both are told to, to strictly stick with doxycycline. If any other drug is used other than doxycycline, or tetracyclines, it has been associated with a higher risk of a fatal outcome. Just start. Mm -hmm. All right, so pre preventative measures, um, there's the common sense things, keeping exposed areas of skin covered, uh, you know, wearing pants when you're out in heavily tick populated areas. Um, you can actually put your socks over your pants and that will sometimes prevent them. Um, wearing hats over areas of exposure with hair um, lawn sleeves, so on and so forth. Uh, but the best preventive measure is to to contract Lyme's disease. You have to have the, the tick buried in your skin for greater than 24 hours. So doing a very good, thorough skin check following uh, the potential exposure to ticks is the best. To protect your canine from tick infections, as shown in this presentation, always use a vet-recommended tick preventative such as Seresto Collars, Canine Advantix, and Frontline Plus. Always be wary of off-brand tick preventatives as these can cause seizures, a much more serious problem. And always check your canine after every walk for ticks. 
in your dog's vet clinic, you can not only get your dog tested for Lyme disease, but you can also get him vaccinated for the Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria. From that, the question arises, why is there not a vaccination for humans? There is actually a very interesting story behind that. There is a vaccination for humans for Lyme disease, but it is no longer sold to the general population. There has only been one vaccination for Lyme disease, and it was called Lymerix. It was first created by the SmithKline Beacom, and it was licensed in 1998. It is a recombinant vaccination that contains outer surface protein A of the Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria. Because of these proteins, it stimulated antibodies that attacked the bacteria as it was still in the tick's gut. It got rid of the bacteria before it ever got to the host body. The tick obtained this vaccination as it was feeding on the host's blood, but it was never regurgitated back into the host, thus causing the host not to have or obtain Lyme disease. The vaccine was fully licensed and about 78% effective. The reason why the vaccine is no longer sold is because so many people claim to have adverse effects due to it. They claim to have pain at the injection site. They also claim to have joint pain, muscle pain, and headaches from the vaccine. Due to the fact that this is not a severely life-threatening disease. It just is more of an inconvenient disease in the eyes of the big vaccine companies. They decided to stop production of the vaccine and not sell it to humans. In conclusion, ticks are very prevalent in this area and can pass along several different diseases. If at all possible, Try your best to prevent ever being contacted by ticks, but in the event that one latches on to you or your pet, consult a physician or a veterinarian today. Remember, if that freckle moves, it's not a freckle. An excellent area of future research would be to see if the most popular tick, i.e. the Lone Star tick, and the most popular infection, i.e. ehrlichiosis, are connected in some way. In making this video, we would like to give special thanks to Dr. Sarah Roshan at Lake Forest Animal Hospital and the doctors at the Animal Emergency and Critical Care Clinic for their clinical insight. Also, Dr. Gillen and Dr. Sattler for assisting in giving us advice on collection techniques, as well as Dr. Bradley Hoprick MD for providing medical information. And finally, Brent Bartlow for video and audio production and help. Thank you very much.